Many Unitarians, including Iglesian Christo, along with modalists, insist that the word or logos in John 1.1 1, 1 is not a divine person at all, but a plan, thought, or concept. And they love to quote the definition of logos to support their claim. Logos can be defined as reason, speech, mind, concept, thought, logic, wisdom, plan. So does this refute what Trinitarians hold to so strongly? The word cannot possibly be a person because of this? The more important question should be, how did John regard or describe the Logos in John chapter 1? The most important thing to find out is what the inspired writer actually meant rather than what we want him to mean. Did he show the Logos to be personal or impersonal, a concept or plan rather than a self-aware individual? Does the context prove the Logos is not a person but a plan, concept, or thought? If so, where? Which verse? Therefore, our goal is to find out what, how John really defined the Logos and why he called Jesus the Logos. This issue directly impacts the true identity and nature of God himself and therefore impacts our eternal destinies. The moment someone can emphatically prove that the Logos is not a concept, idea, plan, thought, etc. is the moment the oneness doctrine and Unitarian doctrine is refuted and contradicted by scripture because their doctrines stand or fall on this interpretation. Jesus being called the Logos is a very important title given to him for a reason. He's called many other different titles. The same context calls him the Light. Other contexts call him the Door, the Good Shepherd, the Lamb, the Bread of Life, the Word of Life, the Alpha and the Omega, etc. Imagine the mess we'd create if we took the literal definitions of all of these and insisted Jesus existed in these ways by nature. The same principle applies to him being called the Logos. Just as there's no reason in the context to interpret Jesus being called the light means he's literally an illuminating impersonal power or force, so too there's no reason to insist Jesus is literally an impersonal concept or plan in John 1.1. 1, 1. If we were to interpret him to be that way, the context would give us a good reason to do so. But there's nothing in the context which does. The, logo, uh, the context shows us the, clearly that the Logos is a person. There are a variety of reasons why this is the case. So here's John 1.1, 1, 1. the word was with God is a very simple and safe translation, but I believe the Greek is more meaningful. Does John 1.1 1, 1 actually mean in the beginning was a plan, and a plan was with God, and a plan was God? And John 1.14 actually means, and a plan became flesh and dwelt among us, and a plan was from the Father? Or in the beginning was an idea, and an idea was with God, and an idea was God? We know that God is, a per is personal and truly exists. The Logos is called God, so the Logos must have substantial existence as a person. If God substantially exists, the Logos substantially exists. And a plan or thought cannot be with God. John was counting on the fact that his readers would realize the Logos cannot be a literal Logos if the Logos was with God. The Greek word for with is pros, and it's also defined as denoting direction, looking to, moving to, towards, relating to, unto, according to respected lexicons. In John 1.29, pros is used to mean direction towards. A plan or concept cannot possibly be towards God or looking to God, but a person can. The word was face to face with God is sound due to the word pros, because the logos was pros, looking to or facing God the Father. It's impossible for a concept or thought to be with God or relating to God. Pros is very often translated as to in the New Testament, meaning towards. Imagine a plan being towards God. I truly believe John thought it would be obvious to his readers that the logos is a person. The one whom the word was with in the beginning is God the Father. The context proves that, and John, uh, 1 John 1, 1 to 3 proves that also. 1 John 1, 1 to 3 describes the word of life, which was from the beginning, according to verse 1, who was called the Son, according to verse 3, as the eternal life that was with, pros, the Father, in verse 2. And John 1, 14 and John 1, 18 also prove the word was with the Father. John 1.14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And the NIV, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory as of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So John 1.14 calls the, the Logos, the one and only, the only Son, or only begotten, which is translated from monogonase. This Word became flesh and was from the Father. The Father didn't become flesh, the Word from the Father did, because the Word became, because before the Word became flesh, the, He was with the Father. John 1.18 also proves the Word, monogonase, 
call, uh, also calls the word monogonais, or the one and only. The one and only is a person distinct from the Father. Both verse 1 and verse 18 prove this person is a divine person. It says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. And in the NIV, No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. So this verse refers to the God the Father, as well as the only Son, who is God, or the only begotten God. This shows two divine persons relating to one another, as only Trinitarians would teach. But some of you may be looking at your Bible, now, and it, it calls Jesus Son rather than God. But scholars are very confident that John originally wrote Monogonese Theos, unique God, rather than Monogonese Huios, unique Son. All non Trinitarians strongly prefer Monogonese Theos not to be in the Bible for obvious reasons. It would prove the Son is another divine person from the Father. But the evidence shows Monogonese Theos was originally written by John. For example, Dr. Edwin Palmer, the executive secretary of the NIV translation, wrote, John 1.18, as inspired by the Holy Spirit, is one of those few clear and decisive texts that declare Jesus is God. But without fault of its own, the King James Version, following inferior manuscripts, altered what the Holy Spirit said through John, calling Jesus Son. So Dr. Palmer regarded Monogonese Theos as inspired by the Holy Spirit, and said the King James Version followed inferior, inferior manuscripts. Also, Dr. James White, in his book, The King James Only Controversy, he wrote, Suffice it to say that the most ancient texts, including the oldest existing copies of, of John's Gospels, of John's Gospel, P66 and P75, as well as a number of the Church's early fathers, refer to Christ as the only begotten God, or more accurately, the unique God. Many, many non-Trinitarians come up with the idea that only begotten God was inserted into the verse by the Gnostics, but there is no evidence for this, nor is there evidence that the Gnostics used Monogonese Theos to support their doctrines. I challenge people to correct me if I'm wrong. Instead, Monogonese Theos is used by early church fathers including Gregory of Nyssa, Eusebius, Origen, Clement of Alexandria, Cyril, Epiphanius, Didymus, and Serarpion. Gregory was a staunch defender of the Trinity, and he certainly didn't regard Monogonese Theos as Gnostic or against the Trinity. He was happy to quote it. The use and quotation of Monogonese Theos was widespread through the early church fathers, which only makes sense if John originally wrote it. James White also said the internal evidence, especially coupled with the ancient attestation of the reading in the papyri, leads one to to take this reading with confidence, and this decision is not reached due to Gnostic or heretical beliefs or leanings, but to the external evidence itself. It is the internal and external evidence itself that proves the Logos being called Monogonese Theos was original and, and inspired. There has to be a very good reason why basically every modern translation in the world chooses Monogonese Theos over Monogonese Huyos. John 1.18 expands upon John 1.1 1, 1 by reinstating it, but further elaborating on it. The prologue of John's Gospel is verse 1 to 18. Verse 18 is the bookend and expansion of verse 1. So John begins his prologue by calling Jesus God, and ends his prologue by calling Jesus God. Therefore the Logos, who is God in John 1.1, 1, 1, is also the only begotten God, NASB, God the only Son, New Revised Standard Version, the, only, the one and only Son who is himself God, NIV, or only God, ESV in John 1.18. Even the New Living Translation translates Monogonese Theos as the unique one who is himself God. Not only this, but since John 1.1 1, 1 is about in the beginning, John 1.18 must be also. Therefore, John 1.1 1, 1 is talking about the Logos, who is, in, who is the one and only. The Father obviously isn't the one and only. The Son is, who is Theos, and who was with or facing the Father before creation itself. This is a conscious person. Not only this, but the Logos was Ain in the beginning. Ain is the imperfect form of Aimi, which means to be, to exist, to be present. I believe this indicates the true substantial existence of the Logos. A plan or concept cannot have any concrete existence, but a person can. The Logos was, exi was always existing in the beginning, and Ain points to no origin where the Logos began to exist. The Logos timelessly, eternally existed. The all things made in verse 3 contain an origin or beginning according to the Greek, but the person called the Logos in John 1, 1 never has any such origin. All of this was deliberately done by John under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The context describes the Logos as a person in a variety of ways. Verse 4 says, in the Logos was life, which could 
could mean a few different things, and is described as having grace and truth in verses 14, 16, and 17. These are the attributes of a person, not a concept. John the Baptist even testified about the Logos in verse 15, saying, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. Jesus existed before John the Baptist, even though he was physically born after him. Jesus pre-existed John the Baptist as a person, not a plan. But perhaps the biggest reason why the Logos has to be a person, according to John, is because verse 18 describes the Logos as being in a close relationship with the Father. It says again, the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, or in the closest relationship with the Father. To be in the bosom of the Father means to be in a very intimate, close relationship. This relationship existed in the beginning before anything was made. The kind of relationship that simply cannot exist between the Father and a plan and can only exist between two persons. The Greek word for bosom is also translated as heart or side. A plan cannot be close to the Father's heart or at his side. And how can Jesus be the Father as oneness theology teaches if he's at his side or relating to the Father? Again, John 1.18 is an expansion of John 1.1. The Logos, or the Son, explains, reveals, declares, or makes known the Father. A conscious divine person does this. This is, only, this is the only meaningful interpretation. John called Jesus the Word for a variety of important reasons. John's point was not at all that Jesus was a literal word or logos, but in my opinion the main reason was to emphasize the fact that the Son explains or declares the Father. A finite mortal creature is not qualified to perfectly reveal, declare, or exp explain the infinite immortal God. The word or logos has always been in a very uh, has always been a very important concept to the Jews as well as the Gentiles. To the Jews the Lord speaks, creates, and declares himself through his word. To the Greeks, the Logos was an impersonal ordering force of the universe, but John fills this Logos with life and personality, describing this word as a person, the Lord Jesus Christ, the monogonist Theos, who created all things and explains the Father, and was face to face with the Father in the beginning, not as an impersonal spoken word, thought, force, or concept. John contradicts what the Jews and the Gentiles believed about the Logos by describing the Logos as a person who is God and Creator, deliberately bringing our minds to Genesis 1-1 because of a deliberate use of the phrase in the beginning, NRK from the LXX, where the true God is God and Creator. Therefore the Logos, or Son, is the same being as the one in Genesis 1-1. And the Son, not a plan, was with God. An eternal person, called the One and Only, explains the Father and is close to the Father's heart in John. 118. The Father and the Son had real communion in the beginning before anything was made. The Logos, who was identified as the only Son, was towards the Father or face to face. A plan or concept cannot possibly fit John's point or John's descriptions. The context gives us no good reason to interpret the Logos in John 1 1 as a literal, impersonal word, thought, idea, plan, or concept. This is imposed on the text. Both the Jews and the Gentiles regarded the Logos of God as something impersonal or abstract, but John was deliberately contradicting this by emphasizing the true Christian belief about the Godhead. The Logos is a divine, eternal person who is with the Father, from the Father, relates to the Father, and explains the Father. That was John's whole point, to reveal and describe the true Jesus of the Bible, the eternal Son of God, the monogamous Theos, the Lord of glory, who created all things. Please meditate and pray about these things. See Seek Christ and grace be with you. I don't see any reason in the context to interpret the Logos as a plan or concept, but every reason to interpret him to be a person.